The next item of business is a debate on Motion 6031 in the name of Michael Matheson on human trafficking and exploitation, making Scotland a hostile place for traffickers and providing effective support for victims. Could those members who wish to speak in this debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion up to 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Officer, can I move the motion in my name? The title of this debate sets out the Scottish Government's objective, making Scotland an increasingly hostile place for those who traffic and exploit other human beings and making the support we provide to victims more effective. Human trafficking and exploitation are abhorrent crimes and abuses of human rights. Trading adults and children as commodities and exploiting them for profit or personal benefit degrades victims and causes lasting physical and psychological damage. No one should be subject to such treatment and no country should tolerate it happening within its borders. Victims may not be imprisoned in a physical sense, but they are imprisoned psychologically, trapped in their circumstances and often hidden in plain sight. The inventiveness of those who peddle human misery in this area is unfortunately astounding. Commercial sexual exploitation, labour exploitation, forced drug cultivation, domestic servitude and sham marriages are just some examples of the types of exploitation that can take place. In 2015, this parliament unanimously passed the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act, creating a new consolidated defence, helping to support our police and prosecutors in tackling human trafficking and exploitation. The Act provides for the protection and support of victims and also provides orders that disrupt the activities of perpetrators. Mr. Officer, as required by the legislation, I laid Scotland's first trafficking and exploitation strategy before this Parliament on the 31st of May 2017. The strategy sets out how we can get better at identifying and supporting victims, at identifying perpetrators and disrupting their activity, at addressing the broader conditions that foster trafficking and awareness raising across the board. There's also a specific section covering the particular needs of child trafficking victims. Children depend on adults for their care and are more vulnerable to coercion and abuse. Sadly, children are trafficked into Scotland, but children born and bred here can also fall prey to trafficking and exploitation. Support and protection for child victims in Scotland is generally provided within the context of Scotland's child protection system. However, the strategy sets out a number of specific actions to strengthen our response to child victims, including the implementation of the children's element of the 2015 Act. The strategy was developed by a wide range of stakeholders. This inclusive approach has drawn praise, including from the uh, from Kevin Highland, who the, is the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner. And I'd like to put on record my thanks for all of those who have contributed to its development. Most importantly, the strategy reflects the views of victims themselves. They've told us about the psychological and the physical scars they bear as a result of their experience. Then, officer, I'm determined to ensure that we continue to reflect the views and of, of victims and to put into place a strategy which is informed by the experience of victims alongside that of other stakeholders. And implementation of the strategy will reflect that in the weeks and months ahead. I would like to also take this opportunity to highlight some of the very specific measures that we're presently taking forward. As members of the Justice Committee will be aware, new orders are being introduced to disrupt trafficking activity. Trafficking and exploitation prevention orders will come into force on the 30th of 
June this year. And trafficking and exploitation risk orders will come into force on the 31st of October this year. These give the police, prosecutors and the courts further options to target those who are responsible for human trafficking and exploitation, making Scotland an increasingly hostile environment for perpetrators. We'll also be taking forward an awareness raising campaign for the public, which will be launched later this year. During the consultation for the strategy, victims of trafficking told us that they wanted the public to know and understand what had happened to them. We're therefore working with a range of partners to develop this campaign over the coming months. But we also need to make sure that we continue to improve the support that is available to victims of trafficking. Then also today, I can announce that I intend to lay regulations which will extend the length of time for which vic adult victims of trafficking recovered in Scotland will be provided with support. Provided the, victim with, provided the victim's consent is provided for support, the Council of Europe requires a minimum period of 30 days for reflection and recovery. Currently, Scotland and the other countries in the UK provide a minimum of 45 days of support. However, in Scotland, we will now go further. The regulations I intend to bring forward in Parliament will specify a period of 90 days. When we consulted on this, the majority of responses highlighted a period of 90 days as being a key step to meeting the aim within the strategy to support victims to safely recover. I'll give way to the member. Jamie Green. Good. The member for uh, taking this intervention. It, on that specific point, therefore, um, by extending that period, will the government provide additional funding to the third sector organisations which support victims, uh, specifically Tara, Migrant Help and the Anchor Centre? Michael Matheson. Uh, yes, uh, we will be uh, to reflect that. I've taken the time to reflect on the responses which we received during the consultation and consider the evidence which has been put forward, including the counter arguments against moving to 90 days. However, President Officer, I believe that 90 days is a commitment which will help to ensure that we are doing as much as possible to support victims of human trafficking here in Scotland. And I would encourage governments across the rest of the UK to follow our lead in this area. President Officer, at the time when Parliament was considering the bill, there was a great deal of pressure both in Parliament and from out with Parliament to mirror the English system of a statutory defence for victims. Then also, at the time, I resisted those proposals because I was clearly of the view that what we were proposing here in Scotland, with the Lord Advocate's instructions and a presumption against prosecution, would be of greater benefit to victims of trafficking. Last October, the Anti-Trafficking Monitoring Group published a report called Class Acts comparing the key provisions in the three UK Human Trafficking Acts. To quote from the report, it states, the Lord Advocate's instructions provide an easily understood set of principles and guidelines on non-prosecution for lawyers and non-lawyers. The Anti-Trafficking Monitoring Group considers this to be exemplary practice and recommends that this be adopted in other UK jurisdictions. Then, officer, I believe the Anti-Trafficking Monitoring Group report reinforces the benefits of the approach that we have taken through the Lord Advocate's instructions and the presumption against prosecution here in Scotland. Then, officer, although we have made progress in tackling human trafficking and exploitation here in Scotland, I'm conscious that there's still a great deal of work to do 150 victims of trafficking and exploitation were recovered and supported in Scotland in 2016. Not a huge number, but each and every one of these individuals is a real person and may have suffered weeks, months and even years of abuse and exploitation. And these are just the ones that we know about because by its very nature, human trafficking is a hidden crime. Our strategy sets out the actions that we will take in order to maintain 
the approach that we have to making sure that Scotland remains a hostile environment for those who wish to perpetrate trafficking. However, partnership will be key to making sure that we do this effectively. The united approach across Europe to tackling this issue in terms of law enforcement and support for victims has been key to the progress that's been achieved to date. Where we can form strong partnerships across borders, it is of mutual benefit in targeting perpetrators and bringing them to justice and in preventing trafficking and re-trafficking of vulnerable people. I strongly believe that this cross-border cooperation must continue if we are to tackle the international trade in both adults and children who are trafficked and exploited. Prime Officer, Scotland's first trafficking and exploitation strategy is a milestone in that journey. And I look forward to moving forward to ensure that we support those victims identified here in Scotland while ensuring that Scotland is a hostile place for those who traffic and exploit other human beings. I call on Claire Baker to speak to and move Amendment 6031.1. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, while I very much recognise the Government's commitment to this issue with the debate and the strategy this afternoon, can I start by thanking my colleague Jenny Mara, MSP, who has done a great deal of work on human trafficking, including bringing forward the Members' Bill, and really helped raise the profile of this crime, both in Parliament and with the public. Um, Jenny Mara is on maternity leave at the moment, but I'm confident that if she were here today, this would be a debate that she would have made a significant contribution to. Uh, Ms Mara's consultation for her Members' Bill received the support of more than 50,000 people. It was one of the highest response rates that has been to any consultation since devolution. And I appreciate that the Government, in their motion, highlight the cross-party support that has been on this issue and that exists on tackling human trafficking in Scotland. It is important that we continue to ensure such cross-party support is uh, achieved and that this Parliament continues to speak with one voice in condemning these abhorrent crimes and we will be supporting the Government motion tonight. The 2015 Act was significant in introducing a single offence and a maximum penalty of life imprisonment for anyone convicted. However, I was recognised with the passing of the Human Trafficking Bill, this can only be the start in dealing with traffickers. We are talking about the exploitation of some of the most vulnerable people in our society, including children. These are crimes and victims that often exist in the margins, that are invisible to authorities, and they are often unable to receive the support and justice that they deserve. Whilst much trafficking, um, sorry, while much trafficking originates outside of Scotland, and with certain areas of the world becoming ever more volatile, this increases the risk and opportunities of this crime, I appreciate there is only so much that we can do as a parliament. Therefore, it is vital that we can do everything possible. This is why we welcome the publication of the strategy and these early days of planning. We must ensure that communities across Scotland are aware of traffickers and that there's no hiding place on the margins for those who wish to exploit the vulnerable. There has been some work undertaken to uh, make the public more aware of the effects of trafficking and recognise that it does happen in Scotland. And I do recognise the new measures that have been outlined by the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon. Trafficking in Scotland does involve sexual ex exploitation, but there's also instances of domestic servitude, of labour exploitation, of organ removal and the operation of criminal gangs. We saw an increase in potential victims of trafficking in Scotland last year, which could be attributed to the bill and a concerted effort to tackle the issue, but we must always be alert. As this strategy progresses, it is important that we continue to see increased detection, but we must be conscious that ultimately we all wish to see an eradication of human trafficking in Scotland, and at some point we would hope to see a downward trajectory in the numbers. But what the statistics can tell us is who is being trafficked, how they are being trafficked and where they are being trafficked. We know the, the number of potential victims was split equally between male and female and that 69% were adults compared to 31% who were children. We also know the majority of adult females were trafficked for sexual exploitation. Female children for a combination of domestic servitude and labour exploitation while well, male adults and children are predominantly trafficked for labour exploitation. We need to ensure that this strategy and our efforts going forward are as evidence-based as they can be. 
Yet whilst we are seeing some success, this is potentially only the tip of the iceberg. Adults must give consent to enter into the national referral mechanism where these statistics uh, originate from. However, in many cases, victims are reluctant to come forward. They are scared of retaliation against themselves in Scotland or against their families back home. We also need often to overcome language or cultural barriers, plus the difficulty of many being purposefully isolated so that they are unaware of the help that is available. These numbers, whilst helpful, do not capture the full extent of human trafficking that exists in Scotland. And although there are different ways of exploiting people, sexual commercial exploitation is one area where we could take further action within the law. We need to challenge demand and by support those involved, which means taking a serious look at criminalising the buying of sex, decriminalising the people involved in prostitution and providing long-term support and exiting services for those exploited through prostitution. This approach could work to disrupt the market for commercial sexual exploitation and feed into our work on tackling human trafficking. Um, I welcome the work the government and outside agencies have undertaken so far to ensure that the public are aware of the signs to look for if they expect someone to be a victim of trafficking. From the physical experience to an appearance to isolation, few or no personal effects to restricted freedom of movement. However, there is much work still to be done. Uh, government polling from earlier this year shows that while many people do believe trafficking to be an issue, the closer it gets to home, the less they believe it's happening near them. 63% believe that trafficking is an issue in the rest of the world, 53% believe that it occurs in Europe, and 30% believe that it occurs in the UK. Yet only 14% believe that human trafficking is an issue in Scotland, uh, dropping to only 5% when people are asked about what happens in their own local area. Uh, Presiding officer, as an amendment sets out today, local authorities do have a key role to play in tackling human trafficking and supporting recovery. Um, and Jamie Green also mentioned the role of third party organisations who play a vital role in this as well. Um, at a statutory level, all child victims must be provided with support and protection and the responsibility for coordinating such services lies with local authorities. They also have the powers to identify and disrupt perpetrators of human trafficking. For them to be able to use these powers, such as uh, the licensing of houses of multiple occupation or environmental health, or to be able to look after child victims, we must be able to ensure that they are fully resourced and funded in this difficult task. If we want the strategy to be effective, we cannot continue to keep seeing cuts to local authority budgets. We keep expecting our council to do more and more with less and less, and this is not sustainable. The same is true of our police. We have high expectations of our police and their role in modern Scotland is changing and becoming ever more complex. They are dealing with challenges that were unknown at the start of this parliament. But Police Scotland is under huge pressure financially and in terms of its governance and leadership. The strategy states that Police Scotland will appropriately record and investigate all forms of trafficking or exploitation as a crime. This is important for informing and developing local services and processes. Yet at the same time, Unison has reported this week that 500 Police Scotland vacancies were not being filled, including in areas at the forefront of criminal activity. Presiding officer, this is a good strategy that we all hope will succeed. We must be confident that it is supported and fully resourced. And that's why we will be supporting the Scottish Government today in their motion, and I urge them to support our amendment. Thank you. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. It's always useful to move it if you wish it supported. <laughs> I now call Madam Tomkins up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm proud that the United Kingdom is a global leader in fighting the evil trade. Uh, in human beings for sex and labour exploitation, we all should be. And I'm proud that as Home Secretary, Theresa May brought forward the Modern Slavery Act, the first of its kind in Europe, that she appointed the world's first anti-slavery commissioner and set up the Modern Slavery Task Force to bring together the heads of MI5, MI6 and the National Crime Agency to coordinate the United Kingdom's response to criminal gangs operating across the world. The act has been described as an international be benchmark to which other jurisdictions aspire, and rightly so. I'm pleased also that Scotland is playing its part. The Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill was introduced into this Parliament six months after Theresa May's Modern Slavery Bill had been introduced into the House of Commons. And the uh, Trafficking and Exploitation Bill was passed with all party support, and we continue to support it uh, now that it is in operation. And we'll be supporting both the government's motion and Claire Baker's amendment uh, at decision time today. 
In introducing the milestone Modern Slavery Bill, Theresa May said that this landmark legislation sends the strongest possible signal to criminals that if you are involved in this vile trade, you will be arrested, you will be prosecuted, and you will be locked up. And it says to victims, you're not alone. We are here to help you. But we must be mindful, presiding officer, that legislative measures are a starting point, not a panacea. When the Trafficking and Exploitation Bill was introduced into the Scottish Parliament in 2015, figures indicated that there were 55 victims of human trafficking in Scotland. That number has now increased to 150, of which almost a third are children. And we know that there will be many more victims of this hidden crime, possibly even running into the thousands, who do not realise that they are being treated as mere commodities, that they are being mercilessly exploited, or who are unable or too frightened to come forward. Now, the UK's Modern Slavery Act has had some time to bed in, and in its first year of operation, it was reviewed by barrister Caroline Hockey. In her report, she succinctly encapsulated the complexities of human trafficking and the enormity of the task that lies ahead across the UK's jurisdictions. She observed that professionals can often miss the indicators of exploitation. This can be a resource-heavy area of investigation. Human beings who are treated as a commodity are rarely used for a single purpose. The offending associated with them, as the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening remarks, can include sham marriages, <coughs> identity fraud, false benefit claims, rape, false imprisonment, violence, and a range of other crimes. The evidence of those crimes is often voluminous, which presents challenges of court management, especially as regards juries. And victims often have multiple vulnerabilities, <coughs> mental health issues, learning difficulties, financial desperation, alcohol or drug dependency. Many victims also have a fear of authority figures or come from places where those in uniform or associated with law enforcement have a negative reputation. And cases involving trafficking across borders require investigators and prosecutors to rely on data from organisations based overseas, which can be time consuming and costly. So we need to bring human trafficking out of the shadows. And I welcome the trafficking and exploitation strategy as the next step in preventing and combating this most degrading of crimes. Its multi-pronged approach towards supporting and protecting victims, disrupting the activities of perpetrators and addressing the conditions that foster trafficking addresses many of the issues that Caroline Hockey touched on in her review of the UK legislation, but it, it will require close monitoring over the coming months and years to assess its impact on the ground. Presiding officer, human trafficking is without doubt a challenging and complex crime and one that is constantly changing. We have a, we've made good progress in Scotland since the Act was passed in 2015, when one Police Scotland officer described the force's response to human trafficking as just fighting in the trenches. But this progress cannot and should not, and should not be impeded by rigid thinking or static strategy. And as Claire Baker's amendment points out, adequate resourcing is key. In our view, we need to build on the successes of the recent legislative measures in this area and go further to focus on the exploitation of vulnerable men, women and children for their labour, people who are moved around our own country and between nations as if they were not human at all. We know that most adult and child victims of trafficking in 2016 were exploited for labour, while a uh, BBC documentary reported that people are now the second most lucrative criminal commodity after drugs. That cannot be allowed in modern society, and the Scottish Conservatives will support action to ensure that it comes to an end once and for all. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and speeches of no more than four minutes, please. And I call Ash Denham to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Presiding officer, people are now the second most lucrative criminal commodity in Scotland. Yes, you heard that correctly. The sale of human beings, second only to drugs, is the most profitable business for criminals, according to a recent BBC documentary. Last year, nearly 4,000 people in the UK suffered at the hands of modern day slavers, encountering violence, rape, mental abuse, and forced labor. The Scottish Government has set forth a very exhaustive strategy to stem the flow of trafficking in Scotland, and I particularly welcome the strategy's focus on victim support and recovery. And as we debate how to make Scotland a hostile place for traffickers, I'd like to use my time today to speak on commercial sexual exploitation, which is, along with forced labour, the primary cause of human trafficking. In fact, across the EU, human trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation is the most reported form of trafficking, according
according to a 2016 report from Europol. In Scotland last year, 57% of females, many of them children, were trafficked for the purposes of sexual exploitation. The business model is easy enough to understand. Prostitution is the market. The market creates demand. The demand fuels the need for more and more trafficking. And unlike a drug, a girl can be sold over and over again, creating huge profits. The industries of trafficking and prostitution are linked, and so to reduce one is to reduce the other. No market equals no demand. No demand equals no trafficking. So if Scotland is to become a hostile place for traffickers, we should look at policy that will specifically challenge that demand and therefore then reduce the market of prostitution. So that's why at the SNP conference in March, we successfully passed a motion on a Scottish model of prostitution. And this policy would decriminalize the sale of sex, criminalize the purchase of sex, and offer a means of support and exit for those who want to leave prostitution. Challenging demand with legislation is required because research evidence has demonstrated that even if punters suspect a girl is underage and or trafficked, it would not stop the majority of them going ahead. The demand challenging policy, which is modelled on a law pioneered in Sweden in 1999, aims to protect the exploited and punish the exploiter. This protection is critical, for as UN definitions around trafficking emphasise, victims are always in a position of vulnerability with little alternative but to submit to abuse. And Scotland, unfortunately, is now in a position where this is becoming more urgent. We're now surrounded by countries, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and now France, that have adopted this Nordic-style model on prostitution. Sweden cut its demand for prostitution in half over a decade, and Norway too has seen a reduction both in buying sex and in trafficking for sexual exploitation. On a wiretapped conversation recorded by Swedish police after they legislated, traffickers were overheard discussing potential locations. Don't bother with Sweden, they said. Traffickers don't care where they go, so long as it's easy for them to do business. So the more difficult we can make it for them, the better. If sex traffickers are displaced from our neighbouring countries, both Ireland and Northern Ireland recently legislated on this, we must not let them turn to Scotland. So in combating human trafficking as a whole, let us enact laws that punish sexual exploitation rather than aid it. Together, let us ensure that the sale and exploitation of human beings are never a top commodity and let's send out the message to sex traffickers that Scotland is closed to your business. Thank you. I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Human trafficking is, as today's motion states, one of the most abhorrent and truly inhumane of crimes. It seems alien to us, something of the past, yet it is a practice that continues now. It's murky and dark and challenges our understanding of what human beings are capable of doing to others. But we must not allow ourselves to believe it is impossible to eradicate it. Modern slavery, just as the overt slave trade that blights our past, must be brought to an end. Right across the political divide, both in this chamber and across our United Kingdom, it's clear that all parties and all politicians and the overwhelming majority of our society recognise that these practices are wrong. They are an affront to all of us and they are an affront to our humanity. And that's why it's so important that we are united in taking steps to bring these vile practices to an end. We only have to look at the recent BBC documentary which identified dozens of sham marriages across Scotland, 70 of them registered in Glasgow and a third of those in the Govan Hill district alone, to understand just how current and relevant uh, our actions uh, and this strategy are going to be, and how important it is that both the government or other organisations and indeed stakeholders 
are coming together to form a comprehensive plan of action to tackle the causes and bring perpetrators to account. Indeed, 150 people in Scotland were recorded as official victims of trafficking last year. But many of those who have experience of working in this area believe that the actual number of victims is in the thousands. This is not acceptable and we cannot afford to stand by. I welcome the recent passage of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act in 2015 and I understand that the implementation of some parts of the Act are still ongoing and we on these benches welcome the toughening of the law and the specific offences and powers that have been given to courts in order to prevent and punish those who carry out trafficking as well as the issuing of new instructions to prosecutors on how trafficking victims should be treated if they are alleged to have committed other offences. But alongside legislation, we need to do more. And that's where I believe that putting a comprehensive strategy in place will help bring together all relevant agencies and promote partnership working. The new 90-day period, as outlined by the Cabinet Secretary, will also give time for support to be delivered. And in addition, I believe that the aims of the strategy itself will help bring this issue out of the darkness and into the light focusing people's minds on identifying victims, identifying perpetrators, and disrupting the activity. It will also bring both the local and the global aspects of this heinous practice to the fore. I therefore welcome today's debate, and I look forward to seeing this strategy implemented in full, and I hope that in due course, we will have other such debates where it's possible to look at how effective uh, the implementation of the strategy has been. And I simply end by saying that we must be mindful that this practice still exists and it still exists on our watch. Therefore, inaction is not an option. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Mary Fee. Ms McGuire, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Human trafficking and exploitation in any form are a cruel and abhorrent abuse of human rights and dignity. It's incumbent upon us as MSPs and as a nation to do all that is in our power to make Scotland a hostile place for those vile individuals who traffic and exploit human beings, to ensure that those who are caught are brought to justice and to support victims and survivors. For this reason, I strongly welcome the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act passed by this Parliament in 2015, which consolidated and strengthened the existing law. There's now a single offence for all kinds of trafficking for the first time. The maximum penalty for trafficking is life imprisonment, and police and prosecutors now have a more robust set of tools to prevent and detect trafficking and to bring those responsible to justice. The Act, of course, also requires Scottish ministers to develop and publish a strategy, and I welcome the publication of Scotland's first trafficking and exploitation strategy last month. I look forward to working with colleagues across the Chamber and with groups across the country to implement its goals as we move forward. As with so many issues of exploitation, women and girls are disproportionately affected, particularly when it comes to commercial sexual exploitation. As stated in the strategy, Scottish figures about trafficking victims in 2016 showed that female adults were trafficked mainly for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Figures relating to children in particular also indicate that many more female than male victims will experience sexual exploitation. Action area three of the strategy is focused on addressing the conditions, both local and global, that foster trafficking and exploitations. The conditions which underpin commercial sexual exploitation, women and girls being forced into sexual slavery, are clear. First and foremost, it's about demand. It is about a minority of people, predominantly men, wanting to buy sexual access to women and girls. TARA, a Scottish Government-funded organisation who pr provides support and assistance to adult victims of trafficking, are clear. We know that women are trafficked into Scotland each year for commercial sex sexual exploitation. This encompasses all aspects of the sex industry, including lap and table dancing, stripping, prostitution, escort services, internet sex sites and pornography. Scotland has a flourishing sex industry and women are trafficked to meet the demand that it creates. Presiding officer, this demand is in turn rooted in the deep and profound gender inequality that permeates our society, an inequality which allows women to be devalued as human beings, bodies objectified and commodified, and then bought and sold, used and traded. 
tackling both this immediate demand and the deeper gender inequality which underpins it, must be seen as a key tool when it comes to tackling the wider evil of human trafficking. The outcome and vision for the trafficking and exploitation strategy is to eliminate human trafficking and exploitation. The Cabinet Secretary described this vision as challenging and ambitious, but also absolutely necessary. To have a hope of achieving this vision, we must address the harm caused by the sex industry. To end the exploitation, we have to end the demand. Presiding officer, it will be challenging, but it's also absolutely necessary. Uh, thank you, Ms. McGuire. Call Mary Fee to be followed by Kate Forbes. Ms. Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, as my colleague Claire Baker has already made reference to, it would be remiss of me in my opening remarks not to mention the contribution of my colleague Jenny Mara, who worked tirelessly to force the issue of human trafficking onto the Scottish Government's agenda. And, Presiding Officer, the tone in the Chamber this afternoon has rightly been a consensual one. There is a clear commitment from parties of all colours to end the truly abhorrent crime of human trafficking. Human trafficking is a stain on our society. It is an abuse of human rights and dignity. And I would like to reiterate Scottish Labour's support for the Government's strategy to tackle human trafficking and exploitation, which has the unequivocal aim of making Scotland a hostile place for human traffickers. However, I, along with my Scottish Labour colleagues, note with concern the SNP's cuts to both local authorities and Police Scotland, which I, do, I am concerned may hinder the implementation and effectiveness of this strategy. Human trafficking is degrading and dehumanising, and there can be few worse crimes than the transaction involving the selling and exploitation of one human being by another. It is quite simply a human rights abuse. It's a crime lacking in humanity, and it's one that's motivated by greed. Human trafficking relies on control, with victims often subject to grooming and violence from their traffickers. And make absolutely no mistake, human trafficking is a form of modern-day slavery. And I'm sure every member of the Scottish Parliament, and all members of the public, who watched last month's BBC Scotland documentary, Humans for Sale, will have been touched by the immense suffering caused by this truly abhorrent, awful crime. The documentary revealed women's harrowing experiences of sham marriages, rape and sexual exploitation. And Europol has stated that Scotland has been specifically targeted by human traffickers, with victims, particularly young women, being recruited by organised crime gangs before being sold to potential grooms. And across Scotland, there are a plethora of fantastic third sector and voluntary organisations working to support victims of human trafficking. For example, the, the Tara Service, which is based in the Glasgow region, Migrant Help and Childline, which op operates across Britain, as well as the Scottish Women's Rights Centre, which has bases both in Hamilton and Glasgow. And these organisations rightly deserve recognition for their incredible work. They offer support and advice to victims of human trafficking. These organisations are undoubtedly the best of us, full of humanity and, and shining examples of hope, despite the fact that they operate under incredibly difficult circumstances. And, presiding officer, in winding to a close, I'd like to once again reiterate Scottish Labour's support for the Scottish Government's tra tra trafficking and exploitation strategy. However, I must once again emphasise that the Scottish Government's cuts to Police Scotland and local authorities do risk hindering the implementation and effectiveness of this strategy. And it is vitally important that this abhorrent crime, this human rights abuse, this form of modern-day slavery is ended once and for all, and Scotland must become a hostile place for traffickers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fee. I call Kate Forbes, be followed by John Finney. Ms. Forbes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Slavery, it conjures up history lessons in school, human beings being transported and then used and abused for somebody else's gain. But in another era, in another world, we don't think of Scotland in 2017. We don't think that there are more people in forced labour worldwide today than when abolitionist William Wilberforce was fighting to end slavery. And why is that? Well, because we don't think twice about the teenager at the car wash or the young girl helping at the nail bar or the hard-working farmhand or the house with the suspiciously closed curtains. 
People trafficked and enslaved into manual labour, domestic servitude, prostitution, pornography, forced begging, benefit fraud, criminality and organ removal, forced to work for little or no pay, living in poor conditions with minimal freedom. And, presiding officer, that is happening in Scotland today in 2017. And the Scottish Government's Human Trafficking and Exploitation Strategies, three action areas of identifying victims, of identifying the perpetrators, and of identifying the partners that we need to work with, cannot be delivered soon enough. They cannot be delivered soon enough for the mother and daughter from Eastern Europe who are locked in a room to serve the men who come and rape them at the same time or for the workers at a hotel in a remote Highland village who've paid thousands to come from Bangladesh and find themselves working from 5am to midnight without pay or freedom, or for the Slovakian girls lured into sham marriages or sold to Glasgow gangs for sex, or for the 16-year-old Vietnamese boy found cowering in bushes in Dumbarton who'd probably been trafficked to Russia and then to Scotland. For each of these genuine cases, whose stories we know because they've been rescued, there are thousands more like them, and they're not just out there somewhere, but here in Scotland, often most hidden because we are still so ignorant of the problem. And, presiding officer, I'm delighted that the Scottish Government's strategy identifies the need for partnership at every level, locally and globally, politically and socially. One such partner could be International Justice Mission, who works with justice systems across the world to rescue victims, to bring criminals to justice, to restore survivors and to strengthen justice systems. It's the largest anti-slavery organisation in the world and, most importantly, it works across borders. And so I want to finish with two stories of freedom because they highlight the freedom that we are longing for for every human being in Scotland and across the world. And it also highlights the importance of working across borders. In 2015, a man living in London was convicted for sexually exploiting children via a webcam and possessing over 4,000 indecent images of children. But on the other side of the world, International Justice Mission worked with the police to rescue four children, including seven-year-old Marco, who were held as slaves in the Philippines, trafficked to meet cyber sex demands by paedophiles in the UK. Marco and the others are now in a government aftercare shelter in the Philippines and enrolled in school. Another rescue operation by International Justice Mission was in India, between the Indian police and IGM, which saw 564 children, women and men rescued from forced labour slavery at a massive brick factory in Chennai. The families lived in tiny tents or rooms, earning less than £5 a week, with pregnant women in, expected to work as well. And a government officer was reported to ask the crowd of workers who wants to go free and was, was met with a stunned silence. And slowly one man raised his hand and then another and before long dozens of tired hands had shot into the air. And presiding officer, there are thousands of tired hands across the world waiting for freedom and that is why we need this strategy to deliver that. Thank you very much, Ms Forbes. I was loath to interrupt those two examples, which were very telling. I call John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to join with colleagues in recognising the work of Jenny Mara on this particular field. And indeed, uh, President Officer, you led the scrutiny as convener of the, the Justice Committee in the last session of this bill. And uh, looking back on, on our Stage 1 report and, and particularly a, a spike briefing that we allude to in there, it's, 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 it's very um, self-evident from what we've heard that this is the reality, but it's worth repeating, and that is that victims of human trafficking are, by and large, already extremely vulnerable people which makes them easy targets for traffickers. In many cases, victims are concealed by physical isolation, language or cultural barriers. And these, these factors permeate everything that we, we've heard so far, and uh, often with fear of retaliation, either directly against themselves or with families back in the homeland. Um, co coercive behaviour, indeed, something that we're presently dealing with uh, um, in the vile domestic setting, coercive behaviour, um, is, is um, a, a key element of this. And for that reason, it's very uh, difficult to... 
estimate actual numbers. There's been a lot of work done on this, that our own Equal Opportunities Committee, Migration and Trafficking in 2010, the Equality and Human Rights, did a Human Trafficking in Scotland report in 2011, and I'd like to uh, mention some of, that, some of that, and that is about the Act, the recruitment of people, and of course we know that that's taking place worldwide, the transportation of people, and there obviously is um, uh, vigilance required by those who, who guard our borders. We, we heard stories of uh, people very directly flying in, but it's their demeanour that gives them away. Um, and uh, the transfer, and transfer became a very important element of this legislation because we know that this commodity, this resource, once it arrives in Scotland, these human beings are transferred within Scotland. And the legislation had to be very clear to pick up that and the aspect of harbouring. The means, and as I've said, it is about coercion, it is about threats, deception, fraud, abuse of power and dealing with it. And the purpose, well, the purpose has been alluded to, it is about exploitation, including sexual exploitation, forced labour. And the, e, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, on their particular, the issue of um, sexual exploitation, it said there's a particular niche um, uh, tra traffic prostitution, it was not an on-street issue but was located in, as they referred to, sex flats. So um, we do know that this has a disproportionate impact on women and girls, and uh, certainly uh, I and my party commend the robust police action in this. It is about multi-agency uh, work and to address this exploitation, and as Ash Denham said, it is about support to exit when the opportunity arises. I want to touch on a couple of things in the very short time, and that is what the Cabinet Secretary alluded to the days. I mean, he talked in, in his statement, um, um, a, a previous online statement, about listening to victims themselves. It's apparent that that's happened. I think the 45 days was good. That we've raised it to 90 days of support is actually excellent. So I, I congratulate the, the Cabinet Secretary on that. And the, the requirement to train professionals to support the signs. The reality is a lot of the victims don't know that they are victims. And in a previous debate, I alluded to a young man from Vietnam who was uh, managing a, a, um, a cannabis farm outside, um, not far from Inverness. He thought he was outside London. There were issues around his age. So again, I'd like to commend um, the, the scrutiny that we did on the statutory defence and the comments that the Cabinet Secretary made about the Lord Advocate's instructions. Because we must be absolutely clear who is a victim and who is an accused in this instance. And the reality is if you've been manhandled and taken around the world and abused, you are a victim, you're not an accused. So I think it's good to have the clarity around that. I know there's no time left to, to say a fraction of what I plan to say, but it's quite apparent that partnership is key and that's the way we'll progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Sandra White. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I think there have been some... Um, very excellent speeches already this afternoon, but could I congratulate Kate Forbes on what I thought was a, an extremely powerful uh, and indeed unsettling uh, speech in all the right ways. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Liberal Democrats were strong supporters of the 2015 legislation, which I think has provided the basis to make Scotland a more hostile env environment for those intent on trafficking and exploitation. Momentum and maintaining that momentum is, of course, uh, key and the, uh, the publication of the strategy, followed, I hope, by the action plan uh, is essential. The three principles of that strategy, a focus on victims and potential victims, a commitment to partnership working and a determination to learn from what works and what doesn't work to respond quickly and anticipate changes to risks and circumstances, I think do provide a solid framework within which to take forward our collective efforts to combat this most grotesque and often insidious of crimes. Understandably, when most people think of human trafficking and exploitation, the image uh, that is conjured up is of forced prostitution, drug and even child trafficking. But these crimes can be complex, very often hidden, and are constantly evolving. Um, and uh, they're not simply committed by and against those from out with the UK. I think the strategy very clearly states that adults and children, including UK citizens, are trafficked and exploited within and between communities, both rural and urban, in Scotland and across the UK as a whole. And this is the uncomfortable truth and one we must be honest in confronting if we are to have any hope of eliminating this scourge. Uh, turning to the action plan uh, to, to, to come, let me uh, flag up briefly a couple of points. Firstly, there needs to be a recognition that trafficking and exploitation can arise out of the vulnerabilities of individuals and communities, poverty, mental health, disability, and many others. We must therefore be doing much more to reduce vulnerability through the collective and collaborative action and targeted interventions by health, social care, and education providers. 
Of course, this already happens, uh, but I think it has undoubtedly been made more difficult, as Claire Baker said, by the squeeze on budgets and, in many cases, the reduction in staffing levels. With heavier workloads, staff often have insufficient time. With the scaling back or even the removal of some services within our communities, the opportunity to problem spot and to intervene early is diminished. I would respectfully suggest that the Scottish Liberal Democrat proposals for a uh, penny on income tax to invest in key education services would have eased some of this pressure while also enhancing our chances of delivering uh, many of the strategy's very laudable objectives. Uh, in cases where risks have been identified, of course, there must also be opportunities to share those concerns with police in a timely manner. That said, uh, it is essential that we guard against excessive, inappropriate and disproportionate sharing of individuals' personal uh, details. The other point I wish to raise before concluding relates to the importance of collaboration on an international scale. Self-evidently, any effort to disrupt far less prevent trafficking or exploitation requires police and security agencies to work seamlessly across borders. Anything else affords criminals an, advan an advantage they will all too willingly exploit. From the wreckage of the increasingly chaotic Brexit negotiations, therefore, needs to be salvaged the ability for cross-border cooperation to combat serious organised crime. Retention of the European arrest warrant, membership of Europol and access to EU information databases would be the starter for 10. In addition, we need to see the reopening of the Dubs Amendment. Failure to do so exposes around 3,000 unaccompanied uh, children, uh, child refugees, to heightened risk of falling victim to trafficking. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I welcome today's debate and the strategy that gives rise to it. This must be translated into an action plan that delivers on the principles of being victim-focused collaborative in approach and committed to constant improvement. And I support the government's motion and the amendment in Claire Baker's name. Thank you very much, Ms MacArthur. I call Sandra White to be followed by Jamie Green. Ms White, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, I'm very pleased to be speaking in this debate on human trafficking and exploitation bill on issues which I know that many here have debated on numerous occasions. And I'm very pleased that we have reached this particular stage having uh, raised this issue along with others in the Scottish Parliament since 1999 and having moved slightly forward, I'm very pleased to see that uh, the hard work uh, ha has paid off with the legislation uh, being brought forward to Parliament. And I do want to thank Jenny Mara and the many individuals and groups who have worked so hard uh, to bring this to fruition. And I do want to wish the bill well, uh, the legislation well, as it does pass through the Parliament. Uh, I also want to congratulate the media, which is something I think we don't do uh, very often in this place. But I do want to congratulate the media and particularly the programme which has been mentioned by many uh, from the BBC and journalist Sam Poling uh, for their very investigative uh, documentary which has been all highlighted uh, the absolute clear link uh, between Eastern European crime gangs and Asian organised crime in Glasgow. Uh, already mentioned, as I said, by a number of members also. Uh, I must also mention the soap opera, if you want to call it that, uh, River City, who have been running a storyline about women being trafficked for sex. I think it's excellent that you know, they pick up on this particular stuff. Uh, human trafficking may not be an easy uh, subject to view, but I think it is really essential to get the message across that human trafficking has no place, not just in Scotland, but in any part of the world or in any society. And I do thank them for highlighting that. Um, officer, I do want to pick up uh, on some particular areas that's already been mentioned, uh, particularly the commercial sexual exploitation. It was mentioned by Ash Denham uh, in a very uh, thoughtful speech. And when Ash mentioned, uh, Ash Denham mentioned it being a business, uh, supply and demand, and eventually prostitution, I thought it was a pretty powerful way to put forward uh, that particular subject. And I do want to thank Ash Denham and others who I fully supported uh, for pursuing, uh, a hard pursuit actually, for pursuing this and successfully ha having this uh, Swedish policy of challenging uh, the demand to end prostitution passed at SNP uh, conference. Sometimes not an easy thing uh, to do, so I do congratulate uh, the people there who got that passed as well. Uh, Liam MacArthur mentioned poverty, and undoubtedly the thread of poverty runs through all of this. The reason why many people are trafficked and many people are duped, as you might say. I mean, you saw that programme from the, the various areas, from the BBC, from Slovakia, etc. The poverty was 
absolutely tangible uh, and people were duped, particularly young women were duped into coming over here and other parts of the UK as well, thinking they were going to get a better life and actually ended up uh, trafficked and having an absolutely abhorrent existence, even to the effect that they were sent back and then trafficked again. Uh, and that's just something which is just abhorrent to any particular society. I thought uh, Kate Fors mentioned an issue which I'd already mentioned as I had a number of constituents affected by this particular issue was uh, the exploitation of trafficking for work, uh, where we had many people who were trafficked uh, as chefs, as waiters, uh, working on building sites, etc., uh, basically who were brought over and found they were sleeping maybe 10 to a room, their passport was taken off them, their money was removed from them, and really they were working for something like one pound a day. So whilst the sexual exploitation of women and children is absolutely abhorrent, we have to look at the other side as well, where the workers are absolutely being exploited too. And I do echo everyone that says that we must have cross-border working uh, throughout Europe as well. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms White. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Phil McGregor, who will get to speak if he presses request to speak button, and he'll also be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, there's very little time available today. I think we're also rushing through our speeches to get as much in as we can. So I'll try and add some, some further thoughts to it. Um, I think what's clear today, I found that last speech very interesting, that the reasons for human trafficking are so wide and varied. You know, we know that forced labour, sex workers, child exploitation and domestic servitude are the main ones, but it can manifest, manifest itself in a whole different variety of ways in people coming uh, to this country thinking they're getting a better life and being ending up in, encapsulated in, in trafficking uh, circumstances. Uh, I guess I shouldn't really be surprised that there are recorded figures of trafficking in Scotland, but I am surprised and indeed I'm quite shocked. It's a sort of practice you never really believe sits on your own doorstep. Um, but experts believe that the official figures really underestimate the number of victims each year. The official figures are around 150, but many uh, in the third sector believe it could be in the thousands. And I think uh, part of that is that the image that we have of what a modern slave might be doesn't always really fit the stereotype. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about um, some of the TV uh, documentaries that have uh, covered this. I recall one from, I think it was last year on BBC Three, uh, about the story of a, a Polish immigrant who'd come to the UK, you know, a burly six-foot guy uh, who came here to do labour work, uh, was forced into agricultural work against his will. And the way he was forced is that they'd taken away his passport, he was given limited access to money, give confined accommodation that he couldn't escape from, but moreover was actually beaten up, beaten up by the, the gangmasters that controlled uh, this, uh, this, um, this group of people. So, given... Uh, I shall. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. I think he makes a very valid point about employment. Would, would the member agree with me that it's very important employers robustly scrutinise the source of their employees? Jamie Green. I do. I do agree. Uh, I think, um, especially in, in those fields of labour and very manual work, often you know cash in hand type work, uh, is even more important that the employers should be looking at where their staff are coming from. Especially if they're using an agency, they might think they're doing the right thing by using a, a, a legitimate agency, but actually behind that there may be unscrupulous uh, uh, work going on. So couldn't agree more. Um, I think given that fear and control, and bearing in mind that fear is a way of controlling people, um, how do we encourage more victims to come forward? And that's one of the things I think we haven't really touched on as much as we could have today. How do we encourage victims to come and seek help when they're living in such unique circumstances of danger? Um, I think it's worth noting also that the serious organised crime strategy shows that uh, human exploitation is not just confined to big cities. It happens in small towns and villages and even in rural economies as well. Uh, rural communities. It's happening under our nose. So how aware of this are we? Uh, or do we uh, choose to close our eyes to what is going around, around us as a society? Um, I welcome the strategy. Uh, I think it's widely supported. It focuses on the victims, uh, but also it really uh, touches on how we identify perpetrators and disrupt their working practice. There's very little to disagree with in the strategy, to be honest. And I think the focus on victims is important. Um, the long-term impact of being a victim of this, of this sort is, is quite inconceivable, but it is really important they overcome that if they are to reintegrate into society. As, uh, as is always the case with these strategies, measurement and monitoring is the key to su its success. And I think the importance is on the Scottish Government and this Parliament to regularly review the strategy and its progress. 
The title of this debate is Making Scotland a Hostile Place for Traffickers, and I couldn't agree more. The message from this place should go out, and it should be an unequivocal and unapologetic message to human traffickers that they are simply not welcome here, and we will not tolerate your activity. Uh, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act introduced a number of new powers to prevent and punish trafficking, including the option of life imprisonment for those who are prosecuted. And I believe we should not shy away from using these powers to their full extent. Uh, as it stands, trafficking is still an unacceptable level for all of us in Scotland and across the UK. Collaboration will be key. Collaboration across governments, across police forces, across enforcement and border agencies, and more importantly, as we saw today, uh, collaboration across the political divide will make this a success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Green. I call Fulton McGregor, the last speaker in the open date. Then we obviously move to closing speeches. Mr McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. As others have said, human trafficking is one of the most important issues that we face, and it must be eradicated as soon as possible. And I am proud that this Parliament has put in place robust legislation with meaningful punishments for those who engage in this abhorrent crime. I am pleased that the Scottish Government is developing a new strategy as well. It would be easy eh, for us to point at the recent legislation and say we are doing our bit. But this renewed focus makes clear that the Scottish Government, this Parliament and the people of Scotland are serious about doing everything in our power to stop trafficking in this country. The strategy, as its first priority, makes clear that victims will be the priority and will, as they should be, offered every bit of support necessary to aid them to safety and recovery. The legislation passed two years ago also puts victims first, something that is welcomed by international watchdogs, such as Amnesty International. Catching and prosecuting perpetrators of human trafficking is crucial to preventing it in the future, but every effort must be made to ensure that the victims are well cared for at all times. Presiding officer, I welcome the plans in this new strategy to run a public awareness campaign. There will be times that people who are victims of trafficking, trafficking come into contact with the general public, with all of us, eh, and people simply can't spot the warning signs. The latest figures show that 149 victims were identified in Scotland in 2016, and this does show an increase from 2015, which, while worrying that there are more victims year on year, shows that the procedures that are in place are getting results. And I think back to uh, my own time uh, as a social worker and the, the training that we had was quite robust in terms of child protection. Um, uh, and, you know, everybody from sort of 2004 um, onwards was, was trained quite well in that, in that kind of area. But something human trafficking wasn't covered. And I think that this will be uh, welcomed over the last couple of years, um, identifying a new training for um, professionals. So clearly the authorities aren't yet identifying all victims, uh, and this is a much bigger problem in Scotland than we would hope. Um, and I think John Finney, amongst others, mentioned some of the, the issues that are around when identifying um, these people. We also know that these figures don't even provide the total number of victims, um, as adult victims are required to consent before being referred under the national referral mechanism, um, uh, as has been discussed. Presiding officer, the Migrant Help and Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance was supported by the Scottish Government with 700,000 in 2016-17, and this has given them resources to support victims. This allows them to provide accommodation, medical treatment and psychological counselling, as well as translators, legal services and help to access compensation. And I'm glad that the Scottish Government has been investing in this. I noticed that um, my Labour uh, colleagues earlier did, um, did say that while well, they welcomed the legislation that uh, they had concerns over the, uh, the, the provision um, to the police service and, and I would ask, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, both colleagues would um, be joined with me in hoping that we, we could have all the, the, the powers at this parliament in order to um, you know, raise the money and, and, and distribute the money uh, as required, because I think this is something that's very consensual, this parliament and this parliament would agree on, um, despite what party uh, they're involved in. Um, and for the justice uh, for victims, the recent, the recent act makes prosecution uh, of perpetrators much more straightforward, and that should be welcomed. A life sentence is now at disposal of the courts, and those who engage in human traf trafficking should take note. As others have said, in Scotland, your actions are not welcome, and our justice system will come down hard on you if you carry on. I welcome the recognition uh, of the Scottish Government that more needs to be done in information gathering and data analysis, as well as information sharing between authorities and where appropriate other countries. This should enhance the detection of patterns of trafficking, make it easier for 
authorities to put a stop to it earlier. Presiding officer, to conclude, I welcome all the steps being taken to eradicate human trafficking from Scotland and look forward to working towards that end in the month and years to come. Thank you very much, Ms McGregor. Closing speeches, I call on Claire Baker to close for Labour. Five minutes, please, Ms Baker, if you're ready. Okay. Uh, thank you, <laughs> President Officer. Um, today has been an interesting debate and I'm pleased to see such consensus around the need to tackle human trafficking. Uh, the trade in people and the modern day slavery of men, women and children is abhorrent and has no place in Scotland. Um, Adam Tompkins described it as a need to come out of the shadows and many members reflected that in their forceful speeches this afternoon and I will try to recognise their contributions. As the Cabinet Secretary said in the foreword to the strategy, this is a living document, so it's important that we listen to um, all views. There was a few things the Cabinet Secretary said. Um, I would like to welcome the increase in the days of support up to 90 days, which is a doubling of the current allowance, and that is very much welcomed. Um, I also welcome the anti-trafficking monitoring group, um, their their emphasis on the importance of the approach that's been adopted by the Crown Office um, around non-prosecution, so in describing it as exemplary practice, that's much to be welcomed. And also the importance of partnerships working across borders. And as we do have uncertainties ahead in terms of our relationship with Europe, it is important that we maintain these networks that have been built up and have been effective. Um, John Finney spoke about the importance of multi-agency working and Fulton McGregor talked about the importance of information sharing and tackling human trafficking is not just an issue for the Justice Secretary but it's also one for health, education and others. And Adam Tonkins made a fair point that um, this is also a UK government effort and it is one, the you know, we're in early days in the strategy, it is one that requires close monitoring and the publication of the strategy is often the easy part. Now it's down to the implementation which can be um, more challenging. Um, a number of members talked about people being the second most lucrative commodity in modern day trading um, and the importance of support for victims and support for recovery. Um, we need to be aware that boys and girls like men and women can experience trafficking in different ways and they therefore may need different support. And John Finney described people as being easy targets and having multiple vulnerabilities. So we are dealing with very complex issues. Um, Ash Denham and Ruth Maguire both talked about demand as what is driving much of the exploitation that happens uh, with people. And they both argued for decriminalising the sale of sex and criminalising the buyer. And they might be aware that Rhoda Grant took um, forward a member's bill in the last parliament that didn't receive enough support across the chamber to take forward this kind of argument. So we might see um, some progress in, in this current parliament. We did hear shocking reports about uh, sexual trafficking this afternoon and the level of abuse that's involved and also the level of awareness that is um, among buyers and their willingness to become involved in that crime. Um, the examples of Sweden and Norway have been given, who have created much more hostile environments. And there is, I think, a serious risk that we could see an increase in Scotland as other countries take action if, if we are left behind on this agenda. Um, we do have to address issues of public perception, and Sandra White made a good point about the effective ways we can communicate with people, whether that's through soap operas or through documentaries and, you know, and having television that appeals to people. Um, Oliver Mundell talked about the importance of focusing people's minds on identifying victims. And human trafficking does ha happen in Scotland. Um, how do we raise awareness that this is an issue that takes pa part in all our communities? And while members talked about commercial sex sexual exploitation, there are also many victims in forced labour and particularly in services that many of us are using every day. Um, the importance of the victim's experience, I think, is to be recognised, of being able to listen to their experience and understand the reasons why they've become trapped in many of these situations, um, often without it being evident to themselves of the situation that they're in. And, you know, Kate Forbes talked about the prevalence of nail bars, car washes, forced begging, um, this kind of activity, and it can be difficult then to identify the victims and the perpetrators. And these are often services that we come into uh, contact with every day. And you're often dealing with victims who are just people who are trying to find a better life for themselves. And you know, I think Kate Forbes gave human faces to the strategy that we are discussing this afternoon. You're also dealing with people who are often tricked into coming to the UK. And as Jamie Green described, um, the control and abuse of forced labour that takes part, there is a role for employers. And I would argue there's also a role for trade unions here in raising profile. Um, 
I mean, I think it has been a, a, an interesting debate this afternoon. Um, I think we also need to recognise it as a global issue, and I think members touched on this when they talked about the reasons why people are trafficked and why the attraction of the UK can be a strong pull for people and how they can then be easily exploited. But we need to make sure that when we're reaching out to this group of victims, as was mentioned by John Finney, that we do recognise some people have um, low literacy and language skills, particularly if English isn't their first language, and we need to make sure that materials can be um, tailored accordingly um, for uh, victims so that we can reach out to them. Now, President Officer, I welcome the strategy, but we must ensure it is followed up with uh, resources and with enforcement and education. And we need to see traffickers who are brought to justice and victims escape the clutches of these gangs. Um, I hope the strategy is a living document. I hope that we can adapt to changing circumstances and to lived experiences of these caught up in such a heinous crime. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Annie Wells to close the Conservative six minutes, please, Ms Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to close the debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. There have been many thoughtful and helpful contributions from across the Chamber this afternoon, and I thank all members for their contributions so far. This, is, this issue is something which I have raised recently at First Minister's questions, when I asked the First Minister about the shocking revelations in the BBC, doc BBC documentary in May, which showed young, young girls who were victims of human trafficking being forced into sham marriages in Govan Hill and Glasgow. Well, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015 and the publication of the Trafficking and Exploitation Strategy on the 30th of May are both welcomed. That documentary highlighted the scale of the challenge which faces us if we are to address this sickening abuse which is taking place in our communities. I welcome the fact that the Act makes it simpler for law enforcement agencies to take action against traffickers by introducing a single offence for all kinds of trafficking. And it's also right that the maximum sentence of the criminal law, life imprisonment, is available to the courts for those who are convicted of trafficking offences. This sends a strong and clear message from this Parliament that the systematic abuse of the human rights of those victims at the hands of the perpetrators will attract the fullest and most severe punishment because it sits alongside the most severe and despicable crimes which are already recognised in Scots law. The Act also places a clear duty on Scottish ministers to ensure that adult victims have access to support and assistance and to ensure that children who are victims or are vulnerable to being victims of trafficking have an adult guardian made available to them. It is crucially important that ministers fulfil this duty because when victims are identified, it is essential that the, corrupt, the correct support is available to them to help them re-establish their lives. I welcome the action which the Scottish Government already takes to fund support for all adult victims of human trafficking in Scotland, in particular the psychological support which is currently provided by the third sector organisations such as Anchor Care can be particularly important. I cannot begin to imagine the horrific psychological and emotional impact which victims of trafficking must endure, but all victims, including those of slavery, servitude or forced labour, should be included in the support which is offered. The strategy commits to considering the issue further, but I would urge the Scottish Government to include those victims in its support services without further delay. I support the actions which the strategy sets out to identify perpetrators, and this must build on the strong powers at the hands of the police and courts to punish those who have been found guilty of trafficking offences. We have heard in this debate about the witness service provided by Victim Support Scotland, and I think this kind of support is crucial. Often the evidence which we need to bring the perpetrators of crime to justice will come from witnesses who are themselves vulnerable and reluctant to give evidence in court. That is why proper support for Victim Support Scotland, for witnesses and court procedures, which are sensitive to the vulnerabilities of victims and witnesses, are essential, and the actions which the strategy sets out in this regard are very welcome. I also support the strategy's focus on preventing violence against women and girls. It's also important that we recognise the huge contribution which the United Kingdom takes to tackling violence against women and girls, and as a result, exploitation and trafficking across the world through our committed commitment to spend 0.7% of GDP on international aid. The 2015 Act requires a review of the, stra the strategy 
within three years of its publication, which means we will have the opportunity to measure its effect effectiveness during the lifetime of this Parliament. And it is, for all the reasons mentioned by others in this debate, of utmost importance that we get this strategy right and address the shameful practices of human trafficking. I would encourage all members and all parties to put aside their traditional differences when this difficult issue arises and ensure the government's actions and strategy are placed under close scrutiny and that any failures are identified and dealt with robustly. That must happen on a continuing basis, as well as when the formal review takes place in 2020. In conclusion, presiding officer, I want to recognise the point made clearly by members throughout the debate about the need for cooperation across borders. Human trafficking and exploitation of vulnerable people takes place without borders and therefore multi-agency and multi-nation efforts to tackle this crime are obviously essential. Continuing cooperation with our European partners as we leave the EU is essential. The UK Government has led efforts internationally to tackle modern slavery and trafficking, including by ensuring that ending modern slavery was included in a UN Sustainable Goal, uh, Development Goal. And I am proud that Scotland, as part of the UK, is leading efforts to, this, to end this heinous crime across the globe, and everyone in this Parliament should welcome that. The Scottish Government strategy gives us the opportunity to build on that success, and for that reason, it is welcomed on this side of the Chamber. We will be supporting the motion and the Labour Amendment at decision time, and work, we will work constructively with others in this Parliament to achieving the eradication of human trafficking and exploitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Wells. I call on Michael Matheson to close for the Government Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, thank all members for their contribution in the course of the this afternoon's uh, debate, uh, where a number of uh, important issues have been raised and the whole issue of tackling human trafficking and uh, exploitation. And uh, in my view, President Officer, from the contributions which were made in the course of this debate, there is a uh, recognition across the Chamber of the complexity in tackling the issue of human trafficking and exploitation. Uh, I also, like others, want to acknowledge the work that has been carried out by other members of cha this chamber, uh, Jenny Mara, uh, Christina McKelvey and Sandra White, over a number of years in uh, pressing government, highlighting the issues uh, in order to make sure we were taking forward all the appropriate measures in order to ensure that we were tackling the issue of human trafficking and exploitation effectively. And I'm also uh, happy to accept the amendment which has been put forward by uh, Claire Baker here uh, this afternoon. Then, officer, um, in Claire Baker's contribution, I thought she made uh, reference to a number of interesting uh, statistics, uh, particularly the statistics around the perception of whether human trafficking was a problem here uh, or whether it was a problem for someone else uh, out with Scotland or uh, the UK. And I think to some degree it illustrates the nature of some of the challenges which we have in this particular uh, area of tackling human trafficking and exploitation, because very often people have a perception that that's something that doesn't take place here. But the statistics in themselves demonstrate that it does take place here in Scotland. Members have referred to the increase. Uh, the number of referrals has increased by 3.4 per cent uh, between 2015 2016 from 145 to 150. And since 2013, uh, referrals have increased by 52 uh, per cent. Uh, interestingly, uh, an equal amount of males and females were referred in 2016, although I know members made particular reference to the impact it has on females. Uh, there have been 75 males alongside 75 females referred into the National Referral Mechanism uh, this year. And sexual exploitation is the most common type of exploitation for adult females uh, who are identified in Scotland, uh, with labour exploitation being the most common type of exploitation for males who are identified here in Scotland. One of the other aspects that the data also highlights is that for the past three years, Vietnamese have been the biggest single nationality group of victims who have been referred into the national referral mechanism uh, from uh, Scotland which I think, President Officer, raises a particular point of interest for us to give further consideration to, and one which I am already giving consideration to within government. 
We can take action in the way that Adam Tompkins mentioned in his own contribution about uh, legislation uh, being part of the process. It's the start of uh, the process. Uh, but in order to take it out of the shadow, uh, not only will the strategy help us in achieving that, we also have to consider what further work we need to do further upstream, at point of origin, in the countries where individuals are being trafficked from as well. Because evidence demonstrates that if we can take forward appropriate measures in these countries, then we can also help to reduce the likelihood of individuals being trafficked as well. And in his contribution, um, uh, Oliver Mandel also made reference to uh, the murky dark trade of human trafficking. And to some degree, I do agree with that. Um, it is a dark trade in some aspects of it. But also in Katie Forbes' contribution, we heard very clearly, and in Jamie Green's contribution, the very public nature of how some of that human trafficking and exploitation has been taking place uh, through labour exploitation, taking place and, uh, for someone who was uh, forced to go into uh, becoming a, a farm labourer. Uh, we know of case studies of individuals becoming labourers in building sites. We've heard of cases that Katie Forbes made reference to in nail bars and also we know, for example, in the fishing industry. I don't want to characterise it uh, as being a particular problem in particular key industries or in particular areas. But nevertheless, what I do think it demonstrates is that very often for many people, this can be happening under your notes. Uh, and the issue is about making sure that people have awareness of it and are conscious of it. That's why part of the strategy is to take forward that public information campaign, which we'll be publishing later this year, to ensure that it's at the forefront of people's minds when they're considering these issues. And I think in the interview, I'll give way to uh, Claire Baker. Baker. Uh, thank you. Um, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could say if the information will be provided in different languages in recognition of the different communities we might be trying to engage with. Cabinet Secretary. I think the Member makes a very important point. We're already engaging with stakeholders, including victims, on how we can best shape uh, this particular campaign, and that will include looking at whether we need to provide it in alternative languages as well, and I'll ensure that's part of our consideration. I also thought in uh, uh, John Finney's intervention on Jamie Green's uh, point around the need for employers to make sure that they are taking forward appropriate checks for individuals they're employing is very important. But in addition to that, I also think it's important that individuals who are landlords, who are letting properties uh, for business purposes, are also considering uh, those individuals that they are letting the properties to, because we know for many of those who are involved in uh, the issue of human trafficking, human exploitation, many of them are involved in serious and organised crime groups. Uh, Organisations uh, that have a whole range of criminality attached to them. And that's why the work which Police Scotland are doing and the work that we do through the, that I chair through the Serious and Organised Crime Task Force is not just about drugs and what many other people would consider to be serious and organised crime, but it is around issues such as human trafficking and human exploitation. And I do think it's also been recognised in the course of this debate uh, by a number of members is the international element of human trafficking and the need to make sure that we are taking forward measures uh, that recognise the cross-border uh, nature of it. One of the organisations that provides particular assistance to Police Scotland is that of Europol. Uh, Europol in supporting joint investigation teams uh, to be able to work across a number of different countries in order to tackle issues such as uh, human trafficking. And that will be an important issue as we go forward with the Brexit negotiations to ensure that we retain our membership of Europol and, where possible, retain access to those joint investigation teams which are not available to associate uh, members. Equally, I think, as Liam MacArthur highlighted, the benefits that come from the European Arrest Warrant in tackling these types of issues will be of particular importance in making sure that they remain available to us in order to help us in the work that we're doing to tackle this form of human uh, trafficking. Saying officer, uh, members highlighted the uh, importance of resources in this area, and I do want to correct Mary Fee, particularly on the issue of Police Scotland's budget. There is no cut to Police Scotland's budget. In fact, Police Scotland's budget is increasing, uh, and it will increase for the rest of this parliamentary session. And we've also, in this year alone, increased the police reform budget to allow them to continue to take forward their transformational uh, work. But it's also important, though, the agencies work in a collaborative fashion. Uh, Police Scotland can't resolve this issue on their own. We can't expect local authorities to deal with all of these issues on their own 
and we can't expect the third sector to deal with it all on their own. But also within the public sector is recognising that education, health and many other parts of our public sector have an important part to play in making sure that they play their role in helping to make Scotland a hostile place to those who want to peddle the human misery of uh, human trafficking and exploitation. Presiding officer, the legislation that this parliament has put in place will make sure that we have the right legislation to take robust measures against those who do perpetrate human trafficking and exploitation when they are prosecuted. The strategy will help us to make sure we build on that legislation in supporting victims and in making sure that we have all of our public agencies working collectively to tackle human trafficking. As a government, we are determined to make, Scotland, make sure Scotland is a hostile place for human trafficking and I welcome the support from members across the chamber here this afternoon for the strategy which we now have in place. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on human trafficking and exploitation. And there are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 6031.1 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend Motion 6031 in the name of Michael Matheson on human trafficking and exploitation uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that Motion 6031 in the name of Michael Matheson as amended be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Neil Findlay. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.